The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory be to you, O Lord. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary of Magdala. Seeing his mother and the disciple he loved standing near her, Jesus said to his mother, Woman, this is your son. Then to the disciple he said, This is your mother. And from that moment, the disciple made a place for her in his home. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. My dear brothers and sisters, we are joyfully celebrating today the feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. Dear to the piety of the Christian people, but especially in the Carmelite religious family. This devotion has biblical foundations with references to Mount Carmel and the prophet Elijah. Mount Carmel is a famous mountain range in the north of Palestine near the Mediterranean Sea and is praised for its beauty in the Old Testament. Actually, mountains and hills are mentioned over 500 times in the Bible. We are familiar with some of them, and they are all related to important persons or events. Mount Sinai or Mount Oreb where Moses received the Ten Commandments, the First Covenant. Mount Zion, the highest point in Jerusalem, where a temple was built. And Isaiah prophesied thrice that people from all over would be flocking to this holy place. Coming to the New Testament, we see Jesus giving the Sermon on the Mount, the New Law. We have the transfiguration of Jesus happening on Mount Tabor. We have the Mount of Olives and finally Mount Calvary. In biblical cultures, mountains were places of God experience where God revealed himself for a simple reason. This place was the highest on the earth and closest to the heavens. The Jews believed that God dwelt in the skies. In India too, temples are often built on mountains. Tirupati or Tirumala in Andhra Pradesh, Nandi Hills in Bangalore, Chamundi Hills in Mysore, all famous temples on mountains. So mountains, and here specifically Mount Carmel, are not just physical realities, but symbolically point to our quest for union with God, that all of us as disciples of Jesus have to undertake from the day of our baptism. St. John of the Cross has one major work titled Ascent of Mount Carmel, which describes the assiduous journey of prayer marked by various forms of purification. We shall now look at two persons presented in the readings today, Prophet Elijah and Our Lady, who are guides on this interior journey, the life of prayer that we ought to make. Mount Carmel is closely associated with the prophet Elijah. 
The father of the church, St. Gregory of Nyssa, writes, Elijah lived on Mount Carmel, which is celebrated and illustrious above all because of the virtue and reputation of him who lived there. It is on Mount Carmel that Prophet Elijah vindicated the honor and preeminence of Yahweh as Israel's God in the ninth century before the Christian era against the Baals to whom the people had defected under King Ahab. Today's first reading reports something that happens before this contest on Mount Carmel. After three years of drought, the prophet, through his prayers, obtains intense rain, anticipated in a small cloud arising from the Mediterranean Sea. In the Carmelite tradition, this cloud is considered to be a sign of the Virgin Mary, who would be offering to mankind the savior of the world, through whom all people will receive showers of mercy and grace. This Carmelite view was accepted by the church, and Pope Pius X included it in his encyclical Ad Diem Illum. Going forward in time to the 12th century, some lay hermits began living on Mount Carmel, dedicating their life to prayer and contemplation. What does the Bible say about the contemplative experience of Prophet Elijah? We, has, we have his statements repeatedly. As the Lord, the God of Israel lives, in whose presence I stand. One of the hallmarks of contemplation is this vivid sense of God's presence. Contemplatives are always aware, conscious of God's presence in them. Another remarkable scripture passage referring to Elijah's contemplation is the theophany or the manifestation, the encounter with God on Mount Oreb, where God is revealed in a still, low whisper. Before this experience on being questioned by God why he was there, Elijah replies, I am burning with zeal for the Lord, God of hosts. In Latin, zelo zelatum sum pro dominus deo exercitum. These words are embossed on the Carmelite emblem they are, in a way, our motto. Thus, the biblical Elijah appears as a contemplative, immersed in and overawed by the presence of God, and also a zealous champion of God's rights on his people and the demands of the covenant. Early Christian writers, fathers of the church, like Origen and Irenaeus, considered Elijah a precursor of monastic orders in the church. The early Carmelites living on Mount Carmel were inspired by the prophet Elijah and reinterpreted the, the, all the biblical texts in 1st and 2nd Kings in the light of their own contemplative charism and vocation. This is especially seen in a very precious work called The Institution of the First Monks. It was a book published around 1370, which is a meditation on the life of Prophet Elijah and was used as a manual for young Carmelites in formation. Even Saints Teresa and John of the Cross might have read this book. We come to the second person, Mary. The early Carmelites on Mount Carmel built and dedicated an oratory to the Blessed Virgin Mary. These hermits, mainly laymen, were called by the people as brothers of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. From earliest times, we have always taken this passage of Mary standing at the foot of the cross as a biblical text 
on the feast day, which was celebrated for the first time in the year 1374. We notice that Mary appears only twice in the entire Gospel of John, but at very crucial or even critical moments. At the beginning of Jesus' ministry, when he launches his public ministry, the wedding feast of Cana, and at the conclusion of his mission on earth, at the foot of the cross. These two episodes have a very close relationship because they both present the role of Mary in relation to the hour of Jesus. She is also addressed as woman in both these cases. But there is also a contrast. At Cana, Mary speaks. She interceded with Jesus <clears throat> on behalf of the bridal couple, which was facing embarrassment. They were running short of wine. At the foot of the cross, Mary is silent. Actually, in the Gospel of John, after Mary pronounces these words at Cana, do whatever he tells you, which she continues to address to us till today, Mary does not utter a single word thereafter. Here, at the foot of the cross, Mary is seen as a contemplative it is no moment of glory in the life of Jesus as on other occasions when Jesus was working miracles. She, in silence, accepts this mystery of witnessing the Son of God, the maker of heaven and earth, in a sense, important and defeated. But instead of jumping to obvious conclusions, wants to deepen her understanding of God's plan for mankind. This needs silence an inward journey. It's a somber moment, and the inner light that comes from faith has to be ignited. Jesus himself in the Sermon on the Mount will speak of this inner light, the inner lamp of the body. Even during the infancy of Jesus, Luke, this is in the Gospel of Luke, he presents Mary pondering over some of the mysteries surrounding her son and treasuring them in her heart. So we have two models, Elijah and above all Mary, teaching and guiding us how to grow in union with God. While we shall keep all the insights we have received so far in our mind, I wish to emphasize two requirements for this interior journey leading to union with God. The first, the importance of external and interior silence. This is what we see in the lives of both Elijah and Mary. God was undoubtedly present in the wind, in the earthquake, in the fire on Mount Oreb. But Elijah had a deeper and transforming experience in a small whisper. Actually, it was sheer silence. Mary continues her prayerful silence begun at the cross in the upper room, along with the disciples, awaiting an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. St. Paul reminds us in the second reading today that it's the Holy Spirit who enables us to call out God as Abba Father in prayer. Looking at our modern times, Pope Emeritus, Benedict XVI, had this to say. We live in a society in which it seems that every space, every moment, must be filled with projects, activities, and noise. There is often no time even to lis listen and to converse. Dear brothers and sisters, let us not fear to create silence within and outside ourselves. If we wish to be able not only to become aware of God's voice, but also to make out the voice of the person beside us, the voices of others. A woman once took her husband to the doctor. 
After examining her, after examining him, he said that what he required was absolute quiet, and so he prescribed a dose of sleeping pills. The woman asked the doctor, how many times should I give him the tablet? And the doctor replied, those sleeping tablets are not for him, they are for you. You should keep silence, then he will have the quiet he needs. There is a close link between the two words, silence and listen. They are made up of the same alphabets, but in different order. In order to listen, we need to be silent. The stages of prayer, according to the famous Jesuit, Father Tone Anthony de Mello, are four. I talk, you listen. You talk, I listen. Neither talks, both listen. Neither talks, neither listens. Silence. A second requirement. We should live according to the Ten Commandments as we reflected during these novenas. It corresponds to a life of virtue. The scapular devotion associated with Our Lady of Mount Carmel has the symbolism of clothing. The bestowal of a garment is seen in the Bible as an indication of love and favor. Jacob gave a multicolored robe to his preferred son, the son he loved most, Joseph. David put his coat on his friend. Jonathan put his coat on his friend, David. Elijah passed on his mantle to Elisha. Mary clothed her son in swaddling clothes. Again, in the New Testament, Jesus speaks of the wedding garment required to take part in the wedding banquet. Further in the New Testament, Paul urges believers to put on Christ. In short, if we don't clothe ourselves with the virtues of Mary, then wearing the scapula becomes meaningless, an empty ritual or devotion. St. Teresa of Avila mentions three virtues she calls them prerequisites for prayer, which are necessary in this interior journey. Humility, detachment, and charity. I only quote her regarding the first, humility. Imitate in some way the great humility of the Blessed Virgin, whose habit we wear. For it is embarrassing to call ourselves her nuns. However much it seems to us that we humble ourselves, we fall far short of being the daughters of such a mother and the brides of such a spouse. We cannot expect to grow in our life of prayer without the Christian virtues. They mutually help one another. The virtues nurture our prayer life and a fruitful prayer life facilitates the growth of virtues. An article in National Geographic several years ago provided a penetrating picture of a mother bird. After a forest fire in Yellowstone National Park, this is in America, forest rangers began their trek up a mountain to assess the fire's damage. One ranger found a bird literally petrified in ashes. It was perched motionless on the ground at the base of a tree, of course, burnt to death. Somewhat sickened by the eerie sight, he knocked over the bird with a stick. When he struck it, Three tiny chicks scurried from under the mother's wings. The loving mother 
keenly aware of the impending disaster, had carried her offspring to the base of a tree and gathered them under her wings, instinctively knowing the toxic smoke would rise. She could have flown over, away to safety, but had refused to abandon her babies. When the blaze had arrived and the heat consummated her small body, the mother remained steadfast because she had been willing to die. Those under the cover of her wings con continued to live. Mary also remained steadfast as her son was dying on the cross and she participated in his sacrifice. As our mother, we are indeed sure that Mary is protecting us, not only from physical danger, but from all evil. The scapula associated with her is a sign of protection. But on the other hand, the scapula reminds us of our commitment to Mary and also inspires us to contemplate her virtues. Let us today identify at least one virtue from the life of Mary which we shall resolve to put into practice from today. A virtue that is badly lacking in our life, a virtue that will foster our interior, our prayer life. And we repeat the petition we made in the opening prayer of this Mass. Mary, our mother, bring us to your holy mountain, Christ our Lord. <laughs> 